Welcome back. I'm going to continue now with the rest of the basic visceral theory. So clinical implications, how is this really going to work? Well, I'm going to walk you through an example that we're all familiar with. The person who is having um, unstable angina or an early heart attack, signs that a lay person is told, uh, you know, if you're a father or your grandmother, if they're complaining of chest pain, chest pressure, left arm pain, jaw pain, back pain, uh, they may get uh, diaphoretic, which means it's an autonomic response. They start to sweat, their skin pallor, uh, their skin color changes. They became uh, very um, ashen looking. These things are happening because of a visceral somatic reflex, actually. That left arm pain, there's nothing wrong with their left arm. What's happening is the, the pathophysiology is oxygen, uh, you have an ischemic event, so blood is not getting to the heart, followed by a hypoxic event, meaning oxygen not getting to the tissues, followed by a necrotic event uh, where cells are dying. Those cells send out big signals to the spinal cord. It goes up the spinal cord and a little bit below the spinal cord. And so they have these symptoms in the soma. They have symptoms of jaw pain, back pain. They get diaphoretic. They may get a stomach ache. They have these symptoms because of that ischemic, hypoxic, necrotic event. That's a viscerosomatic response. So that idea we can use uh, to treat patients. So organs respond to two things. They respond to abnormal proprioception and they respond to cell death. So we'll discuss a little bit later in this lecture, we can use abnormal proprioception to try and override a somatic, an abnormal somatic response. We can also use mobility to get a visceral, visceral response. And I will go more into that in coming slides. So um, motility, uh, motility, or let me go back up to the, to the blue one, facilitation. So chronic things that have been going on for a period of time, not the acute situation, that may actually change the neural input that's happening at that level of the cord. Whereas the eff effector output is being chronically changed because neural threshold has changed. That concept we call a facilitated segment. Motility, okay, we keep these ideas separate, mobility and motility. Motility is an energetic palpation. As I said, this hasn't been proved scientifically. So it has implications, not proof, it has implications in the overall wellness of an organ or the existence of an energy cyst, meaning um, energy is trapped in that location. So, the use of mobility will be more clear for the beginner. We can move the liver uh, to try and aid a right shoulder, right neck problem. We can move the stomach for a left shoulder, left neck problem. We can move cecum and sigmoid colon for low back issues. That will be more clear to the beginning practitioner. What will be less clear is trying to treat an energy cyst in the liver. How should that affect the patient? So. Uh, motility takes a bit more time and understanding to see how this applies. I apply them all together. In other words, if you have a low back spasm, I may decide to do a cecum or a sigmoid mobilization to help that low back spasm. If I feel an energy cyst in the liver, I will treat it purely for the reason that I feel the energy is not moving properly there. I don't know how that will change the rest of you, the patient's complaint pattern. This is a very complicated diagram and I'm, I'm gonna make it a little bit easier rather than going into all of the um, particularities. So something happens out here in the viscera or happens in the soma, happens in the muscle and it gives us a response back to the cord. That response is mostly gonna go up and it's gonna go a little bit down. That's why the person having uh, a hypoxic or necrotic event in the heart. They might, the event that goes down, they may feel a stomach ache before they feel anything else. The part that goes up is why they may feel shoulder and neck pain. Okay. 
there's a theory called gate theory, and it postulates that the nervous stimuli uh, gets inhibited at the substantia gelatinosa in the dorsal horn and spinal cord before it reaches the thalamus and cerebral cortex. Now that's theory. I will give you a simpler example. And the simple example will be, uh, you're complaining of back pain and I step on your foot. The back pain is gonna feel a little bit better for a short period of time or a longer period of time because I gave your neurons something else that's now competing for that stimulus. Uh, pharmacologically, when we give people painkillers, um, it's a similar idea. Uh, the, 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 uh, the pain receptors are being competed with uh, non steroidals or uh, opioid things that are competing for the same pain receptors to block them. They're not fixing the problem, they're competing for receptors. So in the same way, we can use mobilization, mobilization to move an organ that doesn't normally feel motion and it causes such a big signal to come into the cord, it may override other somatic signals that are going out to the back spasm, to the neck spasm. Um, that is a very simplified explanation of how we're using mobility. Uh, let's take a look around the abdomen. Um, what I want to show here is there's just kind of a, there's just a concept. We all know these diagrams and there's some sort of simple concept that we have organs and important things in here and the rest is just inert air. Well, there isn't inert air, okay? Air under the diaphragm, that's a, that's a medical emergency. There's a, there's, a, there's a fistula somewhere if we have air under the diaphragm. So things have a certain consistency in the abdomen. Here we can see the liver, gallbladder, pancreas, um, kidneys, uh, vertebra, abdominal aorta. And you can see these big structures. Nothing here uh, will be air. Um, uh, so these things all have a certain motion in a way that they're moving uh, against each other. And we can use these for the benefit of our patients. Um, this organization, and I will just give you my own opinions from my experience doing surgery when I was a young student. We, and again, these are pictures we all know. We kind of look at this as a disorganized mess here in the bowel, but actually it's not disorganized. Our body is very organized. So we have areas where motion is obviously allowed here and we want motion to happen here. Why? What's happening here? Peristalsis. So we need motion. When this motion is impeded, either we get a stenosis or a volvulus or an intussusception, things that impede that motion immediately. If that motion is impeded or twisted, we get ischemia, hypoxia, and necrosis, and it becomes a surgical situation. When we look from a side view in the abdomen, uh, this is with the um, jejunal ileum removed. What we see is it's not actually disorganized. You see the mesenteric root starts in the upper left and goes down to the lower right. So that each loop of bell can do its motion without twisting up against another loop of bell. In other words, if I go back, it looks like this is all crazy here, but it's not. They have a small area to play without twisting up on another area. Um, relationships. There's things that are retroperitoneal, things that are behind this layer of peritoneum. And then there are things that are in front of the peritoneum. Things that are in front of the peritoneum have to move more. Things that are behind the peritoneum, kidneys, part of the spleen, uh, duodenum, these things need to stay in a certain place. And again, it is for structure and function. Things that are moving should move. When things don't do what they should do, we get pain and dysfunction. Circulatory system. Certainly um, proper abdominal uh, manipulation can help improve the vascular supply, can absolutely help uh, the lymphatic flow because these things are being moved and in the case of lymphatics very directly being uh, pumped by diaphragmatic motion. Also your inferior vena cava is um, filling up the uh, left ventricle by diaphragmatic motion, mostly two thirds of it by diaphragmatic motion. So the diaphragm becomes uh, very important for us as far as there's a crossover between 
what we're calling visceral manipulation, it would not be wrong or inaccurate to say we're doing myofascial manipulation. You can't exactly separate these out. In the seminar world, things have become specifically one thing or another thing. Oh, I'm now I'm doing visceral manipulation. No, now I'm doing myofascial. These are sometimes artificial uh, distinctions in my opinion. So abdominal techniques, we can do them as visceral manipulation. We certainly can do them as LAS. We can do them as counter strain, uh, myofascial and, and many others. So this becomes very important uh, for good visceral health. Um, it directly affects your oxygenation, your pulmonary system, your cardiac system, your lymphatic system. And indirectly, we can extend that to your muscular ax axillary, your axial muscles and so forth, the digestion and reproductive system. So what is normally happening in the abdomen? Well, peristalsis is happening. Peristalsis is happening and compartmentalization is happening. So we should always hear bowel sounds. If we hear two minutes of no bowel sounds, then there's a problem. There's, there's a perforation somewhere and air has gotten under the diaphragm. So this system is always working whether we're aware of it or not. The things that stimulate peristalsis, there's, there's local, there's autonomic, and there is endocrine stimulation for that. Locally, you put food in your stomach, the stomach expands and there's a local neural reflex to contract. Autonomically, uh, your vagus nerve is causing the, um, these, these contractions. Uh, splanchnic nerves will be blocking those contractions in a vegetative state. And then lastly, uh, you smell somebody cooking something that you like and immediately your stomach starts making noises. That's cholecystokinin coming from the um, endocrine system, um, preparing you for peristalsis. So what is our goal in the musculoskeletal world? Well, we have several. Uh, we can treat visceral conditions such as uh, uh, irritable bowel uh, is a very common condition that's often associated with chronic low back problems because they're sharing the same nerve innervation. So we can look at treating organ problems because uh, by stimulating them and creating a um, upsetting the threshold momentarily so that it finds a better homeostasis, or we can move normal uh, bowel, normal organs, and create a stimulus that goes back to the cord to try and affect uh, you know, our big common players of muscles that we're dealing with in a, muscle in a purely musculoskeletal world, QL, iliopsoas, um, and so forth, as well as you know, on the other side, director spinae, uh, lats, and so forth. These are gonna be regional techniques. And the reason why I say regional is to do a liver lift or a stomach lift or to do other deep manipulations. They are not specific to one particular segment or one particular um, muscle band. They're gonna be across a larger area. And that's why I use the terms global, regional, and local. Even with great specificity, their reaction can be quite uh, significant. Uh, I'm, going to I'm going to conclude this lecture here on theory and what will be forthcoming is demonstration of techniques in, in following uh, YouTube videos that we'll be putting up. Uh, I thank you for uh, joining me in this lecture and if you like what we're doing please subscribe and let your friends know. Thank you very much.